after selling Mongo, I've uh, you know ended up with quite a nice windfall, and uh, I've managed to stay away from making any you know crazy risky investments. Um, now I'm starting to really think about how do I invest in startups. Uh, you know, I've actually invested in three companies already. Okay. And they were done typically as you would expect. Oh, I know this guy. Sounds good. Oh, someone referred me. I like the deck. Um, feel good about the industry. Now I actually want to create a process and structure and uh, make startups a larger part of my portfolio. So, uh, yeah, I'd love your advice on uh, what to do. Um, you're an angel investor as well as a professional investor in both cases. Well, I've right? never been an angel investor. I've always been an institutional seed investor. Institutional seed yeah. investor, what does that mean? So the way I differentiate between the two yeah. is an angel does what you've started doing, which is sort of says, eh, that looks interesting and puts some money in. Right. And an institutional seed investor actually applies some rigor, which is what you want to move to. Yes. So I quibble with the term angel only because the vast majority of angels are spray and pray. They throw right. 100 darts and they hope one of them lands on Google. It almost never does. They usually lose most or all of their money. And even, even diversifying across like tens to hundreds of startups, they'll lose a lot of money. The data is not good on doing that. Oh. There's a very small number of people that have succeeded. Now, one of the biggest challenges with that style of investing is I think that everybody started off. So the first super angel was Ron Conway. Right. Ron Conway made an enormous number of investments. I think the, the quote I've heard was 300. He got Google and Facebook out of that. But he didn't really get much else. So without both of those, I'm not sure how that portfolio would have looked. He also got to put in relatively constrained amounts in one of the two. So oh. you've got, the, the issue for me is not that it can't work, it's that think about when and who, when Ron Way, Conway came in and who he was. Super connected. All these like actors and sports figures and people that entrepreneurs wanted to know and people just wanted to know. He was also pretty much the first guy to institutionalize the process of angel investing. So he had great access. He was early. He paid low prices, <laughs> right? None of those things are true for the new guy. So what he did then worked for him because of who he was and the time he was there. Today, it's uh, just not feasible to bank on that as a strategy then. It's just really, really hard. Now, there's going to be outliers. Any angel that took part in the first rounds of Uber did just fine. You know, you couldn't make enough mistakes not to make your money back if you had a decent chunk in Uber. Um, but by and large, there was a time when I was first talking to venture firms, when I was a seed, an institutional seed investor, and I had had enough success, I'd had an IPO, I'd had a couple billion of private outcomes where multiple funds had started talking to me about a role. And interestingly, the process of getting a role in venture is eternal and Sisyphean and just all kinds of fun. Uh, and I'm super proud and happy to be at NEA because it's literally the best firm in the world, in my view, for all the things I want to be able to do in life. But along that journey, I probably talked to half a dozen funds in real seriousness, and they all, you know, just the process went on and on, and the conversations went on and on, and maybe that's because it's me. Maybe I'm just too hard to hire. Uh, maybe I'm impossible to hire. Maybe I should never have a job. Anyway, what I found late in one of those conversations was, Somebody said to me, look, Ben, you're number one on the list. It's like, great, it's been a year. How long will it take for me to move from number one to actually being in the seat? And he said, but, you know, we've talked to all of the angels. We've talked to all the seed investors. You're the only one with return. Really? This is his quote, not mine. And now, this is Silicon mind, Valley, right? Yes. Where we've got so many people that are, like, got great access to startups, and yet they're just not giving a decent enough return, especially, and you, I'm also it's hearing hard. you tell me now, maybe the VCs are afraid of bringing on an angel who's got the type of approach. Well, let's come to the later point in a minute. Yeah. On the first point, I do want to make this clear. People that are angel or seed investors that have a desire to work at a venture firm are de facto not the ones <laughs> that are embedded in the most successful seed funds, right? There are many great seed funds. Floodgate does a great job. First Round does a great job. There's, there's multiple. Uh, Michael Deering does a great job. Sure. There's many folks out there that do a very good job, but they do such a good job, they're able to raise plenty of money, so they don't need to think about what's next in their own lives and careers. They're doing what's next. They're doing seed investing institutionally. They're leading the rounds. They're taking the board seats. And those folks do exceptionally well. Where I differentiate is in sort of the individual actor. Mm. They have a much harder time. Um, the longer they've been in, the more access they have, and that helps. But there's very little proprietary access out there. 
it's these days entrepreneurs have enough coaches, whether it's me as one of their early investors, you as somebody that they know, even as a friend that's gone through the process to get the inside scoop. And so they're not gonna go talk to just one person. Now, there are people at NEA that get proprietary deal flow because one was a CTO of Sun, one was a CTO of SGI. I mean, they've had phenomenal results and they've been around for such a long time. They have sure. really tight knit relationships with people that have done phenomenal things. We'll come back to them. Also because, and this is something I'd tell you to do as well, mm. it's very important for any venture capitalist, but it's also important to investors at any stage. You've got to provide value to your entrepreneurs. Like think about when you were raising your early rounds. I was in your seed round. Right. You had a relatively broad seed round. I think there were a bunch of people. We had like 20, 30 investors. Right. How many do you remember as being of value to you? Just a handful. Right. Yeah. And so if you're not one of those ones of value, the chance of having that next opportunity gets really, really skinny. Oh, exactly. There's people like you who I'd go to for sure when, I, you know, when I'm ready, if I'm ready for uh, raising money. And there's others I was like, thanks for the check. I had these big expectations because you had a really good uh, CV. But I didn't really get much value, and it took me forever to get a meeting with you, and that was only when we did well. <laughs> yeah, it's not uncommon. There's, there's a lot of, you got to do your diligence, right, as an entrepreneur and as an investor. So, right. But that's a tale for another day. Yeah. I mean, you know when you talk to your entrepreneurs, yeah. make sure they do their work to make so, sure they pick the right people. I think you've hit it on the head. I want to make the transition from just being a, an angel investor to an institutional seed investor. and. I'm glad I haven't overexposed myself yet to the startup asset class because the spray and pray approach is one that uh, isn't going to get me returns. Uh, of course, I want to do this because I enjoy it, but I also want to generate returns. So how, how do I get started? There's just so many things to think about. And um, I'm trying to create a structure. Any, any idea on how to figure out what that structure should be? Structure in terms of, well, one, you, you understand how QSBS works, so. Yeah, yeah, I don't, don't mean. You want to yeah, do that. I definitely don't mean so. transactional structure. I mean, how many startups should I invest mm. in? What percentage of my portfolio should I put it in? And also, Got it. what stages do I invest? How much money do I reserve? And then all these soft things that come with that. Like yeah. what I do when everyone reaches out to me. <laughs> it's very funny, because this is definitely deja vu all over again, because I it remember, in, yeah. well, we had, you know, my rule when I was a seed investor, I have to see you once a quarter. You can see me as many times as you want. <laughs> you and I had a, a meeting once where we were sitting at this up and coming bakery. I remember it, a big wooden table, some good muffins or something. And you said, what should I be focused on next? I was like, I haven't heard the update yet. And he said, oh, I know, but I got this many people and we're at this low revenue and did it. I was like, Yes, but I don't have the update. I don't know what's going well, what's going poorly. No, but I just want to know as a company. And I remember, I don't know if I said it out loud, but I was thinking, do you think there's a book? Like, is there a book where chapter one, chapter two, chapter three, like it all changes. It's all. Yeah. So I get the desire and there is a lot we can talk about. But one thing I think you would benefit from thinking through is that it's different for everybody. Mm. So let's talk about stage as an example. Yeah. Well, do you enjoy working with entrepreneurs that are learning all the mistakes that they haven't learned yet, that you already know they're going to make, that you've lived through? That's frustrating because um, you, you see a problem and it's so tempting for you to just dive in and do it, but you can't do that as the investor. Correct. You have to empower the entrepreneur. I don't really know. Um, I tried advising some companies once and I was just getting way too many phone calls. And here I am getting uh, someone calling me saying, hey, I need you to look at this uh, legal contract I downloaded online for my first customer. And on my desk, there's like a $50 million contract for Vongor that I'm trying to like figure out. And I'm like, you want me to take time out of what I'm doing to do this? I mean, it's simple, you know, just do X, Y, Z, but it doesn't work like that. So I'm not sure really. Um, it's about bandwidth too, and yeah. I don't know what's realistic. Am I going to be getting flooded with entrepreneurs taking my money and asking me to have a meeting every single day and that becomes my full-time job? That seems what's rare. What's likely to happen? So when my rule was, I can see you anytime you want to see me, but I have to see you once a quarter, Right. it was usually once a quarter. Did you not have people reaching out like, Ben, I want to talk it's to you? It's relatively you. rare. And what happens huh. is, at least in my experience, I mean, I was an entrepreneur, I took my company public, I had 25 years of, of founder experience to share. Yeah. What usually happens, at least in my experience, is they call you when something catalyzes a question and mm -hmm. not 
I mean, I would never transmit to anybody that I would look at their contracts because that's way too granular a function and I'm not, not meant to replace a lawyer and I think my time's worth a lot more than whatever you're paying your lawyer for. So I can be valuable to people in different areas and I tried to make that clear. What I would generally say is, look, there's probably two primary things you're going to lean into me for. Yeah. I was an entrepreneur for 25 years, so I've lived through a lot of pain. I've made a lot of mistakes. I can help you not make them if you've got big decisions you want to make. Which is the value I got from working with you, of course. Well, so that's that one. Advice, yeah. That triggers calls. And the other is I've spent a lot of time trying to learn this venture ecosystem and how to fundraise. And I can help you with that. And I can help you when it's time to raise your Series A, getting you to the right people if I think you're ready to raise, not if you do. So I, in some ways, constrained where I thought I could provide value. And that's usually where I got outreach. So it sounds like you were very clear about what you can offer and what you can't. Yes. And so like engineers, yeah. I can't help you. You need more engineers? <laughs> I got nothing for you. Every one of my founders needs more engineers. It's easy talent. for you to say no. Don't you feel obliged when a, an entrepreneur reaches out and needs help and you're like, well, I don't know, but let me try. Or do you just simply say, I'm not the guy, go somewhere else? I usually don't get the call because that I can't help you with engineers happens in the first meeting. So setting clear first, expectations. But, yes. It's sort of, you know, yeah. in fairness to you and to them, there's no reason. I have this simple view of life. The good stuff will take care of itself. Deal with the bad stuff up front. Deal with anything that could be a conflict. Mm -hmm. So... You know, I'd say, look, there's places I can help you. There's places I can't. I wouldn't go so far as to say I can't read your legal contracts because it <laughs> never would have occurred to me. But I just you know, probably got unlucky with this one startup entrepreneur who was, uh, ne you know, needed to be micromanaged. Needy. And eventually yeah. I actually said, you know what, I don't think I can do this anymore, this advisory thing. Um, I'll give back half my equity and uh, we're done. And I, I'm worried about repeating that experience, yeah. but it looks like I may have just had one bad experience and I need to do a better job with setting expectations. Well, you, it's valuable to you that you went through that because I would argue that everybody that invests in an entrepreneur wants to believe they can provide value. Yeah. So let's start at the want. I'd, a meaningful subset have the ability to provide value, sure. and then a subset of those actually do. So if you're one that has the desire, has the ability, and is willing to do it, you're going to come up in the top quartile at least, if not the top 10%, particularly at the early stage you may be going in. Having said that, when an entrepreneur needs you, doesn't want to have you involved and can benefit from it, but needs you involved, that's usually a sign of some challenges ahead. There's, I remember there was one time I made the same mistake you did in a different way. I had an entrepreneur. I told him how my process was. I have to see you once a quarter. He said, I'd rather see you more often. Could we meet once a week? And I was like, oh, I'm so gratified. This guy wants my advice. What I should have thought is, uh-oh, why do you need to meet me once a week? You have that much to learn? Everybody has a lot to learn, but once a week. So I did do it, and it might have been viable for it to have been useful, but it became clear pretty quickly that it wasn't going to be. I'll give you an example of this. He asked for advice on X, and I said, well, it's your decision, but I can tell you from my experience I've had success with this, and you might want to think about this, and all that. And I left. And the next week comes along, and he's like, take a look at what we did. I was like, what do you mean? He said, well, this is from the advice you gave me. I'm like, it was a proposal to a client. So you didn't send that out last week? It's like, dude, your thing, exactly as it was last week, is better than the perfect document this week. You just gave up a week. Right. How can you give up a week in a sales cycle? Like, that's, uh, so my it's, advice was it's like it's optional. A, it's a red flag with that entrepreneur. It can be. I've... Uh, later on. Do you think this, because I was um, perhaps positioning myself the wrong way, I was uh, uh, offering advice rather than money at the time, because I didn't have money at the time. Um, and therefore, as an advisor, advisor they're going to try to take as much as they can, versus if you're a financial investor, okay, to use that term yeah, crudely, fair. then the expectations might be more clear, do you feel? Probably. Yeah. Um, I got two different answers to that. One, with my friends that took advisory roles, and in some ways I sort of wish that in the very beginning I took advisory roles instead of putting my money to work, because I probably could have really? gotten more of the company than the small checks I was writing. Yes, yes. Right? Yes. Like, so I come to you with my $50,000 check or whatever it was, or I ask if I can get 50 basis points. Well, if you're willing to give me 50 basis points, I'm farther ahead from an equity standpoint, and I'm leveraging my time and experience. Now, the question is, is there adverse selection where you're like, sorry, Ben, I've got an oversubscribed round. You seem great, but I can't have you in unless you're putting money in, da 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 well, well, more so today, your time is worth money now, and your time probably isn't worth advising for that 50 basis points. Oh, absolutely. No, this is more when I was starting, starting out. Yeah. It seemed like it could have been a way to leverage myself in a different way and perhaps be more involved. All my friends that went in as advisors in the start have said that it pretty much is they lean on you a lot in the beginning, then a lot less, and then never. And so they would, like, when people would give me, and I took very, maybe four advisory roles in my entire life, 
And I was always very caught up in things like, I didn't ask to be paid in cash, except for the very first one, which I realized was a mistake and I shouldn't have done that. I didn't know anything about advising, I had just moved here. But I was concerned about the vesting structure. I was like, I'm gonna be very clear on what I can do for you and what I can't, and when I can be available for you and when I can't. But I can't just wait around for four years. If I'm gonna to commit to you, I'm committing that I'm available, and if I'm committing to be available, and so I would ask for, say, half up front and half vested over a year. Sure. A lot of my friends are like, it doesn't matter. They use you a lot in the beginning, and then they never use you again, and they never care, and they never cancel. Yeah. So you just get four years to slowly roll over time. Um, but when you're going in as an investor, yes. so it, it varies a lot by what the rest of your day is, meaning, I don't, I, I, somebody offered me, I looked at a company that was a Series B company. We couldn't get there as a firm. I passed, really liked the entrepreneur. He called me back two days later and said, would you be willing to be an advisor? I was like, uh, well, I thought about it a lot, but the answer was no. I mean, my job, full time, all day, every day, is to look for the best opportunities for NEA. Now, in theory, maybe that would get me that much closer and have me learn more, but it just, it felt, Awkward. Now, if he'd said, why don't you put a little bit of money into the round? Okay, I can do early stage investments. This was a little later stage than I would normally go. But when I do that, I have a really clear dialogue with the entrepreneur. First of all, it's something we've already passed on. I'm not going to try to take NEA's deal flow. Secondly, what I'll say to them is, look, I have a full-time, more than full-time job. I want to be there for you. But you come after the firm and my founders. Yeah. Reverse that order. You come after my founders and my firm. So it may have to be creative. And I've had entrepreneurs do things as creative as pick me up at the airport, or go with me to the airport, yeah. or walk with me in between two meetings. For, I'm totally fine with whatever time I can make available. If they want to meet at night or on the weekends, that's fine, but I do ask them to come to my house because I don't want to abandon my family. But they can come, and it's supposed to be an hour, and it usually ends up being two. But you know, it's, it has to be outside the construct because but I have a your duty. Main, main focus is, is what you're saying. It has to be exactly. Outside. So mine's a complicated situation because it's I'm not working for anyone. It's my money. I'm diversifying it across yeah. different assets. So how do I figure? So you out have to set your own rules, and they may have to be artificial. Yeah. Like you have to figure out how to lead a balanced life, be helpful to. You. So it's, it's a it's a interesting tension. If you're not providing value to the entrepreneurs. I don't know that it matters that you're in, right? Over right. time, you're not gonna get that. You're often not gonna have enough money invested to have pro rata rights, as an example. Maybe your most exciting companies you wanna put more money in. Yeah. Well, if you haven't been around, think about your first 30 investors. If all 30 showed up and say, oh, the Series B is so exciting, we gotta put our money in, and you're already oversubscribed, maybe, not always, you lean into the people that helped you. Of course. But no, the other 27, yeah. you're like, sorry, you have your investment, you have your rights, that's that. So I do think you want to be able to give them the time. I would argue it's less about how much time you give them and more about what you are willing to give them time for. Hmm. You want to be able to, in some way, I don't know how to express it because you're in a very different role and position right now than I have been since a long time ago, to be able to, in essence, say, I am happy to be helpful where I can be valuable to you and it makes sense that I am the uniquely qualified person to be so. Yeah. CEO level advice maybe fundraising advice, things like that. What I can't be is a day-to-day -day source of outsourced labor, <laughs> right? I can't, right. I, only because you use that one example. I'm not gonna be your psychologist. I'm not gonna be your CEO coach. I'm not well, gonna- Well, actually, there's pieces of that. Pieces of that, is it really? Because, mm -hmm. well, think about it. Like, when you and I would meet, um, and this wasn't just you and I, this was with many of my founders, a lot of time the questions I got from them were more around what I would generally call personal development in the CEO role. And it wasn't that I was a CEO coach. It was more, they would say, hey, you, you've been a CEO for a long time. You took company public. This is something I'm struggling with. Um, I've had yeah, the conversation. That's, that's different to a regular once a week. Help oh, yeah, 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 yeah. No, I get that. This is what I want to avoid. But, I want to be helpful. Um, I guess I just need to figure out um, the artificial constraints. And also, it's pretty difficult to, you know, when I was running my company and probably when you were running yours too, your company was your life and your life was your company. And it was very hard to sympathize with people when they say, sorry, I've got to respect my family time. I've got to respect yeah, my personal I, time. And you're like, are you kidding me? I'm doing everything I can to grow my company and you're giving me this whole family spiel. Um, but it is important for me to have yeah. a lifestyle because I've worked very hard to get there. Um, but I somehow don't think that's going to resonate with a hungry entrepreneur who, you know, wants my time. So I, and I want to protect it because I want to go to the gym. <laughs> yeah, I get that. I don't have a perfect answer for you. 
by any means. I don't know if I have a very good one. One of the things I learned was I'm willing to do an outrageous amount for my entrepreneurs if they need it and it's yeah. justified. So the most extreme example was I had a founder that was um, raising around, I just use this as an example of when yeah. sometimes you do destroy your life for your founders and I think it's the right thing to do. They were having, uh, now I was on the board, so that's a different level. Uh, they were going to do a big announcement on their round. They were in the mobile space. And I said, have you thought about Mobile World Congress? And they mm, said, mm, we don't mm. really know much about it. And I said, well, it's the biggest mobile conference in the world, and it's happening next week. And they said, well, if we could be on stage, we'd go. I was like, all right, let me get to work. So I spent the next two days solid leveraging yeah. everybody I had ever met that could possibly help. And all of them said the same thing. You're an idiot. <laughs> it's never going to happen. This thing was planned a year ahead. There are no slots. Don't bother to waste your time. And even if you can, don't bother to go. So on hour 47 of this 48 hour journey, I get a connection that actually says, I have a place for you. I can put you on stage in a startup competition. And I'm so excited, it's perfect. So I go back to the founder, I'm like, I did it. I got us the, the slot. He said, oh, that's great. You could, you could help with that, right? I was like, sure, if there's some way I can help, I'd be happy to. You could go to Barcelona. <laughs> I was like, wait, what? <laughs> I'm not the guy running this company. I'm not one of the four founders. And he said, well, we've got all these things with the fundraising, and we really can't go, but it seems like a great opportunity. Would you go for us? And so I thought about it, and my answer was yes. Now, in order for that answer to be yes, I had to wipe out a week's worth of appointments, yeah. figure out how to get to Barcelona <laughs> a couple of days before the biggest trade show that exists there, yeah. find a place to stay. You know, I had to beg a room from a friend. I slept on somebody's couch. You know, like I had to pitch their business. It was sort of like 17 hour work days, 15 hour work days, 12 hour work days. By the way, I pitched and won the competition. Good, excellent. So we got a lot of media. So it was well worth it. My, yeah. my point is, in that instance, it felt like it was needed and it was the right thing to do. But then you were a board member. You weren't just an investor. And that's that's a true. Very different commitment. You wouldn't. But I was do still that. a board member from my seed experience, not as a venture capitalist. Oh, I see. I was a board member in only a tiny number of the companies I seeded. Yeah. Two. I'm guessing you had a meaningful stake, though, to make it worth your while. I don't know. It's all relative. I don't... At that do you, point, Do you I don't find know. your... Once you've made the investment, um, are you looking at your personal outcome and how much of the company you own um, and how life-changing an outcome could be uh, when you're deciding to spend time? Nope. Well, well, common sense would dictate that the more money I have in something, the more likely I'm going to pay attention to. Ch check this out. Um, a lot of people are worried about having certain VCs involved because you're tiny to those VCs and they'll ignore you. Um, what's your thoughts on that? So it varies. I'll tell you, I'm in a very different place for a very specific reason. When I started out, I was running the equity practice for a big venture debt shop. I thought that meant I would be creating a small venture platform. Mm -hmm. Turns out it was more about deal flow and I had a lot of freedom, but the checks were at least missing one zero. Mm. Sometimes my personal checks were bigger than the checks I wrote on behalf of that firm. Probably the case with us too, right? Yeah, I think we were probably tied. Yeah. Now, actually in fairness, think about how much money I put into you, but I was still willing to give you time anytime that's you right, needed, you right? And it's and not I, like there was, was a lot. And that's also why we're talking today. It was very rare and helpful, but for your own sanity, you can't scale that up. Uh, but well, for my sanity too, I, I don't want to be spending 24 hours a day on this. I want to help those when they need it. Um, so I agree with the help when they need it. Yeah. The amount of time is variable based on how many of your entrepreneurs need your help. Mm -hmm. But I'll tell you where I got, and you may not get there. Yeah. It really bugged me that I had to write these small checks. Like I wanted to put much more money into these entrepreneurs. Right, right. And so one day I sat down somewhere and said, you know what? It doesn't matter how big the check is. An investor is an investor. It's binary. A dollar, a million dollars, a hundred million dollars. If I'm an investor in that company, I am an equity holder and participant. I am an investor and I will treat them all that way. I will immediately forget how much money I put in. In fact, it's not uncommon for me to forget how much money I put in. You and I were talking at your liquidity moment. Because of organization moment, or because you just don't think it's relevant anymore? Because I decided to take all of my pride and all of my time and focus it on the companies I chose to invest in irrespective of the dollar amount. So it sounds to me like um, the main motivation for you and probably something I need to circle in on is, uh, it's fun, it's something you get energy out of and it's independent of the financial outcome. If you believe you're a good investor, yeah. on average you will make a return. But if you're gonna spend your time on this, it's because you like that entrepreneur and you get a buzz out of it. W would that be a fair characterization? Reasonable. Yeah. I'll, I'll give you two specific examples on, well one, I also think you have to be somewhat 
fiercely logical because your money is at stake. Now that doesn't, and you might say, then why would you spend so much time with a company that you have such a tiny investment in? But yeah. that's my whole, if I'm your investor, I'm your investor, period. I met a guy that I had this much invested in that came to me for help on his Series C. And I was like, why is your board not doing this? He's like, well, you know, I come to you with questions. I only go to them with answers. I thought that was a fascinating point because I hope I'm never that type of board member. But he would lean in to me on occasion on things that were pretty material. Um, That's fun. You're making a decision. So you're helping someone make a decision at a very high impact, a catalyst type of moment. Well, and sometimes there are moments in entrepreneurs' lives that are very difficult. And they have to sort of figure out. I've had the following conversation with multiple people. I thought it would take this long. It's really going to take this long. And I always say the same thing. I told you in the beginning it was a seven to 10 year journey. And the answer from one person, I'm thinking there's a, uh, I won't mention the company, it's in another state, said, I know, but I didn't believe you. <laughs> and so sometimes helping an entrepreneur sort of understand so, how yeah, hard that, it is. I said that to you too. I said, I can't believe it's been about seven, eight years. And I thought this would have, uh, it would have been pretty binary, you know, three, four years were done, or it's going to be a 20, 30 year thing. But that's easy to say in hindsight. The first few years feel like forever, and you're like, "Wow!" Yeah, it does take a long time thing. to build a great company, and the way that grow, ha- growth happens is crazy. So I want to, I want to. Um, focus well, let me stay on this for one, one more yeah. second. So I have a lot of empathy for entrepreneurs, and if I can help them get through what I would consider a business personal crisis, then I want to do so. I want to yeah. help more to give them new ways of thinking. But going back to the point of how much you have invested, impacting how you act. I had an entrepreneur who came to me once who said, "I really need introductions to these people." And I said, I can't do that for you. And he said, why not? I said, you're not ready to raise. You are not yet fundable by a tier one firm for Series A for the following reasons. And at the end of the conversation, he said, Ben, you have a pretty big investment in me. I was like, so? I actually had triple the investment in him that was my normal check size. I was very excited in the beginning. So you're acting with integrity, really. You're, 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 you want to help for the sake of you know, being there and helping, but it has to make sense and it has to be the right thing yes. at the time, independent of financial... Uh, Correct. It has to be on merit. I built a, a set of relationships across over 300 VCs, and one of the things I heard consistently from them was, look, in 10 years, I had two people say no to a meeting I offered. And I offered a lot of meetings because I made sure they were going to be a fit. It doesn't mean they'd fund them, but it meant they would see the value on the other side. No one's going to say, oh, my God, I can't believe I took that meeting. i got to never take a meeting from Ben again. So if you take the entrepreneur, think of it like I think of myself as an adoptive parent with a lot of kids. Okay. Now, maybe they don't think of themselves as kids, and that's fair. But if I've got 17 adopted children and the lazy one, wants me to introduce them to my best friend who's the head of admissions at Stanford, and I do it, Frank's then on my yours. rock star yeah. daughter, who's actually deserving, won't get the meeting. And so you, I think you do have to be fiercely logical. By the way, that same entrepreneur who has never gone on to raise, whenever he calls me, I try to find time. And we sit down and we talk about different things. And to be honest, at some yeah. point, it gets repetitive if you're trying to teach the same lesson over and over again and no one wants to hear it. But the only time I've ever chosen to not spend more time on something is when an entrepreneur took a path that was so egregious hmm. and I tried very hard to, I don't say what somebody should do. I try to tell stories of my own experiences to illustrate why it might not be a good option. This was the only time ever. After 58 minutes of storytelling, I said, I have never said no to an entrepreneur, but you cannot do this. You will kill the company. And they looked at me and said, Ben, I've really appreciated your advice. I'm going to take that back to the team, but we've already done it. I was like, great, I'm supportive then. Right. Can we turn these meetings into calls? Because I insisted that everything be a face-to-face meeting. And at that point I realized, I can't help this person. They're not gonna come to me with things they want answers to. They're gonna come to me with the answers they've already created. And they're just gonna want me to rubber stamp them. And by the way, that did effectively kill the company. So we did have a couple more calls before the company died, and it went as planned. I didn't want to go, I would have loved to have been proven wrong. Every once in a while when I get proven wrong, it's great. I'd obviously rather make money than lose it. Um, I could go much deeper into that story because then there were a series of other events where they didn't listen, and now I'm literally not gonna get a penny out of that deal when there was some hope we would have gotten something. But anyway, you, you should apply fierce logic, but at the same time, your entrepreneurs are your point of First and foremost, I feel incredibly empathetic to anybody that's going to dedicate their life to being an entrepreneur. And if I've then gone so far as to choose to fund them, I'm really, really picky. I mean, maybe I shouldn't be so picky. I don't know. But if I've gone through all of that and had all those multiple meetings, 
because it always takes me about three meetings. I remember this. It's like I'm not a yes in the first meeting guy. I'm either no in the first meeting or I want to spend more time with you. Want to find a way to say yes but need more time. Yeah, and then it takes a while. So then um, that really helps figure out one key area, which is um, why I'm doing this. I do want to help, uh, but I need to really protect uh, something that's invaluable to me, which is also you know the lifestyle. I've worked very hard yeah. to maintain this. So how many companies should I be investing in and um, what stages? Uh, I'm trying to really get a handle on this. Um, otherwise, it's going to be spray and pray across every industry, every vertical. How, what's the best way for me to get to an answer to this question? That's a highly personalized question both stage and quantity, because it depends on you. Like, I funded about 82 companies over 10 years. At peak, I had 56 companies that I met with every quarter. I will tell you that was quite stressful. It was hard to get that many Especially physical meetings. Especially with your meetings. role, right? Once yeah. a quarter and as many times as yeah. you want, I'm available. But you can infer that if I was having 56 quarterly meetings, I wasn't having 102 or 112 weekly calls. So I think part of it is how you work with the entrepreneurs, and part of it is your own capacity. I think of it as a muscle that grows over time. You know, The more you do, the more you're capable of doing. You should protect your lifestyle. You have the right to for multiple reasons. One, you've achieved as an entrepreneur. Your advice, therefore, should be of some meaningful value. But you're also putting in capital. Yes. As somebody that's putting in capital, you want to be able to help, but you're entitled to say, I can only, if you wanted to, you could say, I'm only a source of capital. I would encourage that because you're A, not going to get the best deals. B, it's not the right way to do things, in my opinion. Yeah. And C, why will the entrepreneur even care? But I think having balance will be very specific to your realities. Um, I have an entrepreneur I funded who later became an investor, and he spent a bunch of time with me and sort of said, for whatever reason, he felt like he's learned a lot about being a seed investor from me. Give him credit for doing most of it on his own, but great. He gets up at four in the morning and spends the first three hours on entrepreneur stuff for his entrepreneurs. Mm. And I was like, you know, I love my entrepreneurs, but I hate to get up in the morning. So once I wake up, I'm happy to look at emails, but I'm not getting up at four to do another three hours of extra work. But that was his model because he had a full-time job. So, you know, I would argue one of the things you can do is set guidelines for the protected time and space. Just as I say NEA has to come first and my founders above all else, you can certainly say my family and my active lifestyle does have to take a precedent. Right now, I spend 26 hours a week on family and lifestyle related things that I'm not interested in giving up. I, whatever, I sail for 12 hours a week. Whatever, that's fine. You have the right to set the guidelines. And then after that, Look, net, net, I'd like to maintain, here's something I said to my wife early on, it didn't work. I said, I spent 25 years as an entrepreneur working ridiculous hours. Now I'd just like to take 40 hours for something normal that I could do. Now her view was, how about the family? And I was like, but, <laughs> anyway, what it worked out was most of those hours were the family, yeah. which was the right thing to do. But you've got a certain, you have the entire right to decide how you're gonna frame this. So if you wanna think about your life as being made up of a 40 hour available time during the week thing, of which you wanna use 20 hours for you and make 20 hours available, whatever. It's not that there's those 20 hours you can call me in these time slots, it's more, here's how I've organized my life. This time is available for entrepreneurs in a general way. Um, however, I have more than one founder. Definitely reach out, I will get to you as soon as I can. Yes. You know, it's not, your goal, and value isn't in being real-time available. Your goal and value, I believe, is in being available for things that rise to the level that you can add value to. And except in the rare instance where the time sensitivity is extreme, then, tomorrow is fine. Yeah. Next week is fine. Coffee at your favorite place is fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know? So it sounds to me like you don't really have um, a structure necessarily where you say I'm going to invest in X amount of deals over nope. X amount of months and dedicate X amount of dollars. That's I did do the dollars. So I think did, what okay. I decided at the beginning was I would take 10% of my net worth, I okay. would put it, in a vehicle, worth, put it in a vehicle, and that was the limit. Now there was some pluses and minuses to that. It didn't impact how many deals a year I would do or anything else. I'll talk about that in a second. What it impacted was my own agreement with myself that this was totally at risk money. You're willing to lose 100% of it. Right, because any investment I've ever made, I've believed has the opportunity to be a zero, just like it has the opportunity to be huge. So just hold on a second, 10% of a net worth spread out over five, 10 years or deployed from day one? How, well, how it was in a bucket, it? so it could have been deployed the very first moment. Now. I didn't want to invest it all in one deal, <laughs> so I wrote smaller checks. I just wrote a lot of them. Is this the 84? Uh, yeah, so if I think yeah. in the first eight years, I did 80 deals. It worked out to about seven to 10 deals a year, personally. 
Now, having said that, I at one point went for six months doing nothing. Okay. Because I'm, heard, you've, I'm sure you've heard my saying, I need five things to make an investment. People, 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 a great idea in a huge market if it works. I haven't had good experience investing in just great people and waiting for them to pivot. I want to believe in the idea they're actually producing. Right. You know, there's companies I've funded post pivot where I'm enormously proud, and I, I know there was one guy that got there before me when they were doing something totally different, and I thought inane. But I'm sort of selfishly thinking, did that really matter? You picked some random people and you hoped it worked, yeah. and in that spray and pray approach, it happened to? So, so let's just say 10 ideas, or sorry, 10 investments a year. You would literally focus on people, 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 and then next look at industry and uh, the idea. So that doesn't mean you're going to be like, I only invest in health technology. I Correct. only invest in software. You were open to whatever came to you. Sure. Lending Club was fintech. Dropcam was hardware. You were ad tech. Yeah. I invested in a company in health tech called Omada Health. I invested in a security company called Cloud Passage. Now, as a VC, I can't do all those categories. But what I've basically said is I will look at any category except security and med tech because those require very specific domain expertise. Hmm. I've always centered on one thing, hmm. entrepreneurs that make me say, wow. Okay. Did you uh, learn anything? So one thing I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about is there's certain industries I'm really curious about I'd like to learn more about. Uh, does investing in the industry necessarily make you an expert and make you learn more? Or uh, that's not the best way to do things and yes, stay away from learn things more. you don't understand? Yes, to learn more, no to expert. Because I would argue expert That's the founder, people, really, and the people that run it day yeah, to day. And even those still have a lot. To, I mean, you. Yeah. I always get surprised. I've spent four or five years looking at the insurance tech space. I've made three investments personally over time. And I still get surprised with new pieces of information all the time. To even pretend maybe I'm lightly cogent, but I'm certainly not expert. But one of the great things, so I think you know I was a freelance writer for 10 years alongside. What I loved about writing was started it was, doing that too. Yeah. It's really fun. Yeah. And to me, it was continuing education because I would write about topics I didn't know anything about. So I have to go do all the research. So I'd have to learn. It's the same. I mean, you can certainly choose, and this is very stage specific, that if I'm pitching you coffee cups and you know nothing about coffee cups, to go do an enormous amount of work and research coffee cups and therefore gain some knowledge. And that's fun. Um, but if I don't have those core pieces, my way of investing was very human centric. I wanted to really believe in the people because I think tenacity is the number one secret to entrepreneurial success. You know how hard it is. You had a moment where you saw that it was going to take a lot longer than you thought. We had that conversation. Like You had to push through some really difficult times or you could have sold the company and done all right, but it wouldn't have been anything close to now. right? So you know, you know how hard that is. Entrepreneurs, they're entrepreneurs and they're entrepreneurs. Hmm. The difference is huge. So a lot of young, creative people, when I met you, I mean, man, you felt like you were fresh out of school and right. bright-eyed and bushy-tailed and energetic and had this great idea and it was trending pretty well. But I mean, you were, you might as well have been a teenager relative to sort of where life had taken you through. And now you've gone through and you've learned all that. And so I always want to remember just how hard all that is. Yeah. And that's why the people are so important. Because a great idea with the wrong people I mean, it has to be a phenomenal idea in the perfect place at the perfect time, and then sometimes it can work, but usually it doesn't. Because if someone's willing to give up, they're going to. And if they give up, you lose all your money or most of it. So the people is critical to me. The idea is very important because I don't want to have to fund into something that has to pivot. And a really big opportunity at the end is key as well. Because one of the things I learned as a discipline for myself, mainly because of the style of investing I was doing, I was investing in companies with one overriding concern when I was running the equity practice for the debt shop. They wanted me to be able to answer the following question. If this goes as planned, is this company going to be more likely than not to raise a Series A round from a Tier 1 firm? Hmm. And if the answer to that was no, they wouldn't fund it. If right. the answer was, and by the way, there's no such thing as yes, it's going to raise. My answer was, if they get these things done, I think it's highly likely. And because of that, I had to look past my own investment horizons and say, what is the NEA partner? look for here? What does the Sequoia partner look for here? What does the Benchmark partner look for here? Is this something that could be like that? And what do they all look for? Big businesses. It's things that can have material outcomes, material impact on the fund. Yeah. And so I very often, my most frequent no, sometimes the people were all that I needed. They were all there. And then the idea was even pretty good, but, or really good. But the total outcome opportunity wasn't big enough. And if I couldn't get to that, that was my most frequent pass. 
Got it. Well, look, this has been very helpful. My three takeaways here would be the difference between an angel investor and being an institutional seed investor, um, setting your own boundaries and not necessarily that every entrepreneur is going to come to you and needing to be micromanaged. That's rare, actually. It was just perhaps one bad experience I had. Um, and lastly, it's about people, people, people over industry. So, uh, you know, I definitely appreciate this, Ben, and want to, want to thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. I'm thank glad you. to have you in. This is fun. Great. Uh, so, Ben, would love to um, give my viewers some advice and tips quickly on uh, raising funding. Uh, why don't we start a bit about very quickly yourself and NEA and what NEA invests in? Sure. Let me start with NEA. Uh, we're going into our 42nd year, I believe. Over 1,000 companies funded across that period of time. 228 IPOs. That's a world record. Wow. And yet, if you walk around this office, you won't see a single tombstone. It's an incredibly humble firm. That's rare. I mean, I've been to many other top tier VC firms and littered everywhere are just plaques and pictures of the founders. It makes you very hungry. You want to be on that. Yeah, I'm, I actually think you it would be nice enough, to put a little. Don't have enough wall space or what? <laughs> we got a lot of wall space, but it's all white. Uh, we have some beautiful art. It's yeah. always historically been a very humble firm. And I, and I really respect that. But at the same time, I think we're in a very noisy environment. And so, uh, you know, if someone once said, if you think of a scale of one to 10 on promotion, there's a recently created firm over the last six years that's at a promotional scale of 11 on a scale of 1 to 10. And then there's NEA at a 2. You know, maybe we should move to a 4. But it's what speaks the loudest for this firm is the phenomenal companies that we've funded, the just great outcomes, everything from Salesforce and Tableau and Workday to, to many others. I mean, we, were, we funded the origin of Wi-Fi, you know, and now we've got this really so cool company. So you guys are industry agnostic to invest in every vertical? Pretty much. It's technology writ large. It's global, although all of our people live in the United States. We travel for global coverage. So you make global investments? Yeah, I'm um, really interested in ben, Europe right now. For my viewers um, looking at this and uh, thinking about potentially working with NEA in the future and yourself, what is your focus at NEA and when should they be reaching out? So we're relatively stage agnostic, although the earlier it goes, like a seed is super rare. Bottom line is there needs to be high conviction. So I what's can get... minimum revenue, for example, when well, you're interested? Or revenue doesn't matter. It, it, it's various. Yeah. I mean, I'll give you two different examples. There's a company we seeded as an early concept with proof of technology in place and no revenue uh, for a big seed where we took the whole thing. And there's a company we're doing a Series A in that I think it's going to be a $150 million check. But they're also doing $85 million of EBITDA. So, you know, that's a pretty big range. Um, are you able personally to um, invest across the whole spectrum as well? Or are you focused on one, uh, one stage of investment? I mean, do you join pre-IPO uh, and also seed stage companies? Or do you only focus on like A and B or whatever? So interestingly, I've written three term sheets here. A million and a half, 15 million, and 150 million dollars. That answers the question then. Right. Right. Now, having yeah. said that, I really love early. It's extraordinarily rare that it would be seed. I think it's much more A and B. A and B is your focus. But you know, it, it, it all ties into the entrepreneur. An yeah. entrepreneur with a big enough vision. And I get a lot of entrepreneurs asking me, how do I get connected to venture capitalists? And um, obviously, it's helpful to get introduction from someone you know. But for my viewers out there who might be in uh, all sorts of regions and aren't here in Silicon Valley or connected, what is the best way for them to uh, get introduced to NEA and get on someone's horizon like yourself, do they still need an introduction? Or is there another uh, efficient way for them to get in touch? Well, an intro certainly helps. It raises it up in the, in the funnel. Um, I used to have something called pitchben.com where you could do a one minute pitch <laughs> and I promised a one minute response. It became a little overwhelming and I, want, and I did promise a response, so we pulled that down for now. Yeah. Um, I'm considering doing an open mic day where people can come pitch in a relatively abbreviated form, no matter who they are or where they're coming from, they would still have to physically be here. Uh, generally speaking, though, what I will say is I read all my emails. I don't have an outsourced human. My EA does not read my emails. I read them all, huh. including the ones that, well, I don't know if LinkedIn forwards the stuff anymore, but generally speaking, I read my Twitter DMs as an example. My only point is I will read them, and if I'm interested, I'll respond but I don't feel obligated to respond to an unsolicited email. So my reading the email and not responding is an indication of a lack of interest, but I do read them. So, yeah. Should people, if they email you, is there something they need to do? What's the best way to format it? Should they attach a deck or not need it at all? I mean, so I look at it as, when I talk to my own entrepreneurs about outreach, there's a 99% chance anybody will read the headline, the subject, if I send it to them. 
there's then a 90% chance that if I send it to them, they'll read the first line if I'm pitching you. And then it goes down every single line. Make the point in the header, right? So if it's, we're a catwalking startup, thank you, delete. Not gonna fund catwalking, I can say that categorically, <laughs> so not need to worry there. But I will tell you what doesn't work. Long, rambling lead-ins. Hi, Ben, I know your time is really valuable, and I don't want to waste it, but I thought you might be interested <laughs> in. All those words are a waste. Just skip it. His yeah, just, his we dad. are a catwalking startup, period. Okay, delete. <laughs> uh, we are the new version of sliced bread using dirt that people can eat. Yeah, eh, probably not. That. I mean, no, I'm actually catwalking startup. It was a pitch. Okay. So I was. So I laughed out loud on that one. I'm sorry. It just seems. God, how do you walk a cat? I don't even know that. Um, so, if you think about what you need to deliver, here's. I'll give you three golden rules. Einstein said, if you can't explain it simply, you don't understand it well enough. Okay. You have to have an elevator pitch. You have to have a one-line elevator pitch that says succinctly what you do. If you don't have that, you're not ready to pitch anyway. Put that in the subject line. I guess two, Einstein's point, and three, if you think about a great deck or a great explanation of what you do, who, what, when, where, why, how, and how much. Who's doing it? How are you doing it? Why are you doing it? Who's buying it from you? How much are they paying you? When did you start doing it? Right? That's about it. It's yeah. Six things. Um, and less is more. Okay. Edit, edit, edit. And then for the first part of it, you said introduction. So how do you assess the quality of introduction and... Um, What's the advice from someone who wants to reach out to you, thinks to have a startup and they can um, articulate it to you? Uh, how should they think about getting introduced to you? Is, is, do you have criteria? Do you have a way of kind of quantifying yeah. the power of an introduction? Sure. Well, the better I know the person and the better I know their expertise, the higher it goes. Um, my founders, right at the top. Okay. Yep. Other investors, highly variable depending on their skill and what I think their goal founders is. Founders at the top. Founders, um, any founder that you've invested in or founders that have had an exit? Um, is there a, do you well, discriminate? The, <laughs> sure. I mean, you, I've got 85 founders over the last decade plus. So amongst those, there are different levels of, let's put it this way. If I founded, if I funded a founder and they did a horrific job of everything they did, then failed the miserably. Then introduction might reflect right. on that. So, like, so what's their judgment like? basically think carefully about who they're getting the introduction from. That might perhaps be a negative stamp on them, do you think? If they get an introduction from someone who you really didn't respect as an entrepreneur or um, another investor. I don't know. I wouldn't say negative. I'd say neutral. Neutral. So certainly you want to go as high so up as you better can. Better to get the intro than to cold email. Yes. Doesn't matter who the interest from, try to get one. Within reason. Ideally, someone who knows you. Yep. Ideally, an entrepreneur you funded who did great. What's below the uh, founders? You said the investors. So let's talk about that level. So you've got, depends on what the stage is. So one of the things in venture that's interesting is one, when one venture capitalist introduces a startup to another venture capitalist, the person on the receiving end always asks why. Yeah, it's bizarre, right? Why aren't they right. doing the deal themselves? Particularly if they're not doing it. Now, maybe, yeah. like if I'm introducing something to a great seed fund, that makes sense because we're not really that focused on that sector. Um, an angel would be a viable intro to me because they're only going to do a certain round. Maybe they did the pre-seed or the friends and family and now it's ready for the next <laughs> level or it's ready for the A. Um, so I tend to take those reasonably seriously, and the better I know that investor, and the better I know their sort of criteria and how they think about the world. Everybody has their own levels of judgment, and you know you try to learn that and infer from it. And then you've got the ecosystem of support, you know, accountants and lawyers, and um, yeah, sure. those are. I think of those as again, the quality of the person is yeah. going to dictate it more than the firm they I came a, from. I have a lot of. Um, um, connections within the student community because I started the uh, entrepreneurship societies. I give lectures at universities. Uh, do you find um, connections and introductions from professors and faculty uh, of uh, any value? Do you, do you get those? So I know that there are folks inside of NEA that find those highly valuable. That is not a network I have cultivated. So Stanford's nearby and there's some phenomenal professors there and I know people respect them enormously and will take their introductions very seriously and I think that's smart. It's just that I have not done the work so you to go. So that's a valuable source. Yeah, well. yeah, can be. Again, to the expertise. Yeah. If the computer science professor shows you the next fragrance company, <laughs> then you're like, well, okay, but why? Now, if the answer is this is the most tenacious and remarkable person I've ever worked with, then you take that then meeting. Then there's people, people. Right. Got it. And final words of advice to my viewers who um, uh, are thinking about raising money, maybe that might be too early for you right now, but what can they do to get ready in the future uh, to raise money from a, a great firm like NEA? 
So I think the probably number one thing I would say to entrepreneurs in general is be very careful who you raise from and make sure that you are aligned with them in their needs over time. In other words, if your desire as an entrepreneur is to build a company and sell it for $50 million, I'm not going to say there's anything wrong with that. You could do that with modest friends and family money and a lot of hard work and keep most of it, and that could be a great outcome. <laughs> it doesn't match what venture needs. So if you were to take venture money and or be prepared for that, try to find a path to it, and then have that outcome come to you, well, you probably didn't tell the venture capitalist that's what your goal was, and that's a problem. And he or she isn't going to be very excited about that outcome, so that creates some conflict. So number one is not so much how do you get to venture, but how do you get to the source of capital that matches your needs over time? Everybody has something inside them that they need to be. And that's what you want your investors to want too. And the difference between a $50 million outcome and a $500 million outcome and a $5 billion outcome are fundamentally the difference between three totally different types of investors. And when you know what you need amongst those three and you want to strive towards it, then you find your mate for that. Because getting money, venture capital investing, any investor, it's a marriage. And it comes with a one-way prenup. And the prenup isn't in your power. So you want to be very aligned with your investors from the very beginning. And I think that's more important than investor X has a great path to investor Y. That's sure. useful as long as that's the path you want to be on and need to be on with your life. Great. Ben Narison, thank you so much. Thank this you. is Zane Jaffer, and please subscribe.